All right. Well, we're going to pick back up in Exodus 30 and 31 this evening, continuing trudging our way on through the, the tabernacle. So the Lord's going to lay out some, some principles for ministry and for life that we can kind of grab a hold of this evening. A lot of, a lot of the, what we've covered so far in the furniture and the different aspects of the tabernacle have really pointed towards Jesus. And much of this still will, um, however, I think the Lord's going to flavor a little bit more for some, for some things to implement into our life. Um, as we finished off with Aaron and his boys getting consecrated and washed up and new clothes and ready for the ministry also showed us a little bit about um, the Lord bringing us into the priesthood, if you will, that uh, once you are brought into the family, as you had to be of the Aaronic family, you so also must be of the family of God in which God makes his kids kings and priests, or a kingdom of priests if you're a New American Standard, but either way, priests. And he told us a little bit about the daily offerings and spending that time offering up your life to the Lord, making that time. As we come to the altar of incense and the, the last few pieces of furniture and things before they take a little bit of a break and uh, then come back and put all of this together. Um, the Lord gives us some, some good stuff, um, some divine instruction. And I looked a lot of it, you know, kind of like, you know, he received the word and they're going to they're gonna have a little bit of life and then they're going to come back and, and put it all together. Um, much of this probably wouldn't have been understood right away. Kind of like when you're, when you're growing up, you get all sorts of good advice, get all sorts of sound counsel and instruction, and it's not till later that you say, oh, <laughs> if they were right, oh, <laughs> that was good advice. <laughs> That's what Israel's got a little bit with them, but we, you know, we have the advantage of looking, looking back, so it's a little easier for us to laugh, but <laughs> so covered a few things, but uh, Exodus chapter 30, we'll begin in verse 1. You shall make an altar to burn incense on. You shall make it of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length and a cubit its width. It shall be square. And two cubits shall be its height. Its horns shall be of one piece with it. And you shall overlay its top, its sides all around, and its horns with pure gold. And you shall make it a molding of gold all around. Two gold rings you shall make for it under the molding on both its sides. You shall place them on its two sides and they will be holders for the poles with which to bear it. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold and you shall put it before the veil that is before the ark of the testimony before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where I will meet with you. So this altar of incense, or otherwise known as the, the golden altar in several other places, and sprinkled throughout this and sprinkled throughout uh, the ministry of talking about the tabernacle and meeting in the tabernacle, God reminds us over and over and over again, this is the place where I'm going to meet you. Of course, as we looked before, all of it spoke of, of Christ, and that is, you know, he is the one who brings us to God. But he reminds these guys, even at this point, this is where I'm going to meet you, over and over and over again. So the altar of incense, um, though it speaks a lot to the person of Jesus Christ, will we'll probably balance out a little bit with also how it speaks to us. As we remember, the, the wood overlaid with gold, along with the, you know, the same with the uh, Ark of the Covenant, it speaks of Christ's humanity and His divinity. Now, this is, a, this is an interesting piece of furniture, as it is the closest thing to the mercy seat. It's the closest thing to where the presence of God was um, in the tabernacle. And they were to offer incense on it. And it was, had these little horn things. And it was about a foot and a half by a foot and a half by about three feet tall. Not a real big 
thing, but tremendously important things occurred on this little altar. Psalm 141, verse 1 and 2 says, Lord, I cry out to you, make haste to me, give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. And we're going to see that kind of build here as we continue on our study tonight, this, this connection between this offering of incense and prayer. Some have taken it a little bit beyond that, but we're going to hold to that because it's, it's good and solid and the Lord, um, I think, would have us stay there. But this, this idea of incense and the prayers going up before the Lord. So it was... It was to symbolize both Jesus and the incense being offered in it was also, I believe, not only symbolic of him making intercession for us, but also our prayers. So let's, let's dig that out just a little bit. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24 and 25. So kind of this twofold thing. First, we'll, let's take a look at one verse and, and uh, point it back to Jesus. Hebrews chapter 7. Verses 24 and 25, speaking of Jesus. But he, because he continues forever, he has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So we know that Jesus has this ministry that continues... Well, apparently as long as we need somebody interceding for us, and that seems to have been a while, <laughs> that he might save to the uttermost those who come to the Lord. So let's check out a little bit what's going on in heaven since we know that Moses went up on the mountain and received instructions that this was a copy of things going on in heaven. So Revelation chapter 5, verse 8 Revelation 5, verse 8. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So we see these, this incense, this thing going up before the Lord, and it says, which is the prayers of the saints. Over a couple more chapters, Revelation chapter 8, Verse 3 and 4, where the Lord says, the, Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. Interesting. He has given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which is before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. So we see this interesting connection as we know that Moses received the instruction from God, a copy of heavenly things. We know that it speaks about Jesus. So not only is he interceding in his petition before the Father going forth, but also our petitions, our prayers. Now we know that it go, our prayers go to the Lord, but... Sometimes our prayers also remain before the Lord. There are some things that are still being worked out. They are still reminding. And so, let's finish off this little section. Verse 7, back in Exodus 30. Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense every morning. When he tends the lamps, he shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense on it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall not offer strange incense on it, or a burnt offering, or a grain offering, nor shall you pour a drink offering on it. And Aaron shall make atonement upon its horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. Once a year he shall make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. 
So this was something to continually go up before the Lord. To continually go up to Him. So we're reminded that our prayers go up to Him, that our prayers go up before Him, and that they are powerful. They're perpetual. He doesn't forget. He always answers. They're fragrant to Him. And it's interesting, as I was thinking about, you know, um, there are many times in the New Testament where I'll speak about people being persecuted or the difficulties or the challenges, and he will, t- and he will speak about um, praying um, about judgment coming, about the things that are going to happen. And the Lord doesn't forget. He doesn't forget the prayers that you prayed over your kids. He doesn't forget the prayers of justice or vengeance or any other things that are in his hands and in his time. And I thought that was interesting, an interesting connection. I mean, whatever, it's not biblical, so take it for whatever it's worth. But interesting that we are built in such a way that our um, smell, our sense of smell, is very, very tied to our memory. And it's interesting that many of these things go up as a sweet aroma before the Lord, that this incense would have to put off a certain smell and it would go up before the Lord. Um, again, I wouldn't make too much of it. I just, For me, that just kind of blessed me and reminded me that even though not everything that uh, we pray is to be answered in the moment or tomorrow, but it certainly does not escape the mind of God or the memory of God as it goes up before Him as we saw in Revelation. And it, again, it, for me, it just kind of reminded it that even by the smell that He doesn't, he doesn't forget and so, but it points back our prayers again to the Lord Jesus Christ because to light this, to get all the incense going, um, it was only to be lit by a coal from the brazen altar where the sacrifice, where the purification for sins occurred, where that was burnt, where your forgiveness or your sins were covered. That's what started. That's what would ignite these prayers, if you will, just as we don't get to come to the Father except through Jesus Christ and the way that He has made. So we're, there's kind of two parts to that in here, and that, that's one of them. The coal was to be taken from the altar. You couldn't pull out your Zippo or your pack of matches or whatever you're packing. It had to be come from where the sacrifice was offered. Um, also, once a year, when they would go in and the high priest would offer the sacrifice um, for the sins of the people or for themselves, they would take some of the blood and they would touch each one of the horns. Of course, we know that that sacrifice spoke also of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so all of that, just bringing into the sacrifice, the cleansing, the blood, and the way that Jesus has made. Not only that, so He could intercede for us, but also that our prayers might be lifted up through Him and in His name. So, just kind of a cool study. You can take it out farther if you'd like, but I just, it's just good. Um, so, we're reminded that it is based on Christ. Our ability, the authority, and even as we look at the sacrifice, both of the sacrifice offered and the blood, both the body and the blood, Um, even our love and our desire to prayer, to pray, should come. For the love of Christ compels us for what He's done, for His goodness. And as we pray for other people or um, forgiveness for ourselves or just exalting or praising the Lord, wherever we're coming to Him in prayer, we're reminded both that we can, we want to, and we have the authority to based on His sacrifice, the body and the blood. Which is kind of a cool, kind of a cool reminder. So as he reminds us here in, in nine and ten, that you're not to offer strange incense on it. I'm not sure what strange incense is, other than different. <laughs> there could be some, you know, some strange stuff out there. But or a burnt offering, a grain offering, drink offerings. There are no peace. There's nothing else to be offered on this. You know, and we come to the Lord and we pray, 
We're not playing, praying from a place of works or bargains. There's no substitutions. Also, it's a place, this is a place for, it's not a place for sacrificial atonement. Prayer is not. It's a place where we enjoy the sacrificial atonement. The sacrifice was made out there, and when we've entered in, come in, we're not still whipping. We, we, we've entered in by His blood. We're seeking Him. We've drawn near to Him. Not unto an angry God, and we have to pay our penance, but unto one where the price has been paid by the body and the blood, and we come in to enjoy that with Him, to speak with Him as He reminds us, this is the place where I'm going to meet with you, not the place I'm going to beat you. So it's not a place to, not to do that. We're not to offer those other things. It's a place to be enjoyed with the Lord. This time where we think and look back to Christ. Also, it reminds us with the, the coal and the blood of the cost. The cost in which was paid. Now something that's going to come up a few times in this chapter is that though salvation is free and these things are free to us, they were by no means free. Salvation and His gifts are absolutely free to us by grace, but they weren't free. So we remember that and we give praise for that. Salvation is free, but as we'll see also here with the ransom money, discipleship costs. Salvation is free, but following Him. So we pray through Jesus. We pray because of Jesus. It's about Him. So the ransom money, verse 11. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, when you take the census of the children of Israel for their number, then every man shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord. When you number them, that there may be no plague among them when you number them. That is, what everyone among those who are, are numbered shall give half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is 20 giras. The half a shekel shall be an offering to the Lord, everyone included among those who are numbered from 20 years old above, shall give an offering to the Lord. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel. When you give an offering to the Lord to make atonement for yourselves, and you shall take the atonement money of the children of Israel and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of meeting, and it shall be a memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. We covered a, a while back with silver. Um, speaks of redemption. It is often tied or, or very close symbolically to um, oftentimes what we think of in blood. It was something that spoke of redemption. But this also goes beyond just being a redeemed people. As the Lord has taught us um, through, through the sacrifices that His people, that we are supposed to learn that we are saved by a substitutionary sacrifice. Not by works, but our sins are transferred to another. You know, and so the, at the coming of Jesus, they would hopefully understand and really put that together. But here He's also teaching that they are a ransomed people, bought also with a price here, this redemption money. And it's interesting that this, this silver here, this, this ransom, what they would pay, would be the silver that would go into building the tabernacle, what it really sat on when it spoke of redemption and that which separated the, the holy things from, from the ground, what all the poles sat on was this redemption silver that they paid. The foundation of it really was redemption. But interesting enough, as they would bring this in, um, as with everything in our life, <laughs> what do we give 
but that which has already been given to us, that which has already been blessed us with. First Chronicles 29.14 says, But who am I, and who are my people, that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. When he brought them out of Egypt with his great sat with his great deliverance, when he gave them victory over the Amalekites, they amassed the silver. It wasn't from being slaves, it was from God's deliverance and the victories in their life that they were able to turn around and offer this. But it's interesting as silver speaks of redemption that each one was to give. Each one was to give. There was no lump sum for a tribe or for a family. Each one gave personally. Each one would give. And it didn't matter who you are or what your station in life. It was all, they were all to be redeemed by the same price. <laughs> Some we might think need a little bigger price. <laughs> they really need to be redeemed. <laughs> but it's all equal at the foot of the cross. The price was all the same, rich or poor, 20 or 80. It was all the same price. It guaranteed protection from a plague, plus so the plague wouldn't come upon them. Interesting that they would later turn this into a yearly temple tax. But, anyways, the, um, you know, it wasn't even really much. I, you know, a, a shekel was about an ounce, so it was about a half ounce of silver. I don't know what that's running today. It's probably not any more than a buck or two. Um, but the idea was that the price was all the same and that each one delivered needed to be redeemed, bought with a price. You weren't your own. And we see that principle really come in, into the New Testament in a whole new light, that you're not your own, you've been bought with a price. Each bought with the same price. Each one redeemed out of Israel. And upon that foundation is where we tabernacle with the Lord. Just as like we've been, we've been going through. So we see he instructs them to number them and to do this. He does this a couple times and then David... One time gets in trouble, <laughs> as we have read before in Second Samuel, where Satan really kind of gets him to go down a bad path, and he numbers the people of the Lord. And so what that also speaks to, and where we kind of draw out from here and a couple other places, is that when you numbered something in this context or in this way, you were really displaying ownership. And so what really, you know, one of the big things in my opinion, what David got himself in trouble is that he was, well, what God has given me, what we're going on here, that's, it's, it's mine. And he got himself in a little bit of trouble. He, this, Israel is the Lord's. Israel's not Israel. Israel wasn't David's. Israel isn't Moses's. It's the Lord's. He bought them. He redeemed them. He brought them out. Verse 17 then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You shall also make a laver of bronze with its base, also of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, and you shall put water in it. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet in water from it. When they go into the tabernacle of meeting or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water lest they die. So they shall wash their hands and their feet lest they die. And it shall be a statute forever to them, to him and to his descendants throughout their generations. All right, so we move on to this next article to be in the... This was out in the courtyard and everything out there, that's, that's bronze. And it usually has to deal with sin or some kind of stuff. But it's interesting that the Lord doesn't give any dimensions for this one. In everything else, he gives very precise dimensions, and this is what it's going to look like. This is how tall, how wide it's going to be. But for the bronze labor, he doesn't. And so, 
it's kind of, it's, it's provocative, I suppose. So we're back out in the courtyard, and the Lord is instructed to build a bronze labor. And this was for, you know, when, you're out, when they're out doing ministry and just getting dirty. Got the mud on the feet, you know, they don't have the, the Nikes or the Adidas or whatever it is that you're wearing, you know, scooting around in some sandals and the feet are nasty. Probably got, you know, mud mixed with blood or whatever else or Billy Bob flicked some awful on them when they were butchering up one of the bulls or, you know, who knows. They would be constantly dirty. And he said, you know, when you're going to go and you're going to minister to me, if you're going to offer this, you're going you're gonna to wash up. You're going to be spiritually you're already spiritually clean, but you're also going to wash up a little bit before you minister to me. And it was very important. So we know that Aaron and his sons from a couple chapters ago, they had this one bath as they were becoming priests, and then they were clothed. And so as we get into this idea of washing for us, we know that we were once for all cleaned. By the washing and renewing of the Holy Spirit, you were washed, you were cleansed by the blood of Christ. And so, as we're going to talk about this washing that goes on afterwards, how that applies to us. So the priest had a one-time bath, but many washings. <laughs> and so this, this bronze labor is going to speak of a process that we're going through, which is sanctification. Not salvation, but sanctification. Because by one sacrifice, Hebrews tells us, we've been um, perfected forever, those who are being sanctified. And we know that, uh, you know, we spend a lot of days blowing it, or we got things going on in our life that need to be cleaned up, or we need to get a little more set aside. And that's, that's what this bronze labor is going to speak of. It's going to speak of when we have the Word of God to iron some things out in our life. So it's interesting in, in Exodus 38, which we'll get to later, that this bronze labor, interesting enough, was actually made up of the the women's mirrors. It came from, um, because they didn't have glass or mirror like we would today, they had polished metal. I don't know, I suppose there have probably been some guys that had them too, but who knows? I don't know, maybe it's just my culture. But But, uh, as they would get the metal for this particular instrument, it would come from something that was used to look and to reflect and check themselves. Interesting. So, there is water in Scripture that is, that, that is for drinking, and it speaks of spiritually, like when Jesus in John 7, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. So there is that, but there is also another thing that correlates with water, and it's the Word of God. You know, in Psalm 119.9, it talks about how can a young man cleanse his way. It's by taking heed according to his word. In Ephesians 5.25 and 27, also helps us to make this link just a little bit. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 27. Speaking to the husbands, but this principle, as we'll see, goes to everybody, but a specific ministry for husbands. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her but with the washing of water by the word that he may present her to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she should be holy and without blemish. This washing by water by the word. In John Chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So as we see this thing made out of that, which was to reflect, to inspect ourselves, and we see in the New Testament the word of God is compared to this water, 
I also want to look at James chapter 1, verse 21 through 25. Continuing on with the word. James chapter 1, beginning in verse 21. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he himself observes and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Looking in to the Word. Seeing what kind of man, seeing what kind of woman that we are. Making those proper adjustments if there's <laughs> looking, hey, I got a little something on my face. Well, I'm going to go wipe that off. I'm going to go get that off. I'm going to make the correction. I'm going to make the adjustment. So this labor, speaking of the Word of God, and it's interesting, as I said, that, that this one was given no dimension was given no express height or width. I find that to be true with the Word of God. In 2 Corinthians 7, 1, it says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. This process of sanctification, though we are never any more perfect before God than we receive in Christ Jesus, there is this process in sanctification where we need to take a, we need to get into the word of God. We need to see what kind of person we are. And we need to walk in that. We need to walk in that. One more one more set of verses there. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22 and 23. I want to beat it to death, but hey, it's Wednesday night. We can take our time. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 and 24. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Amen. Oop, I started one verse too late. Let us draw near, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. All the promises of God are yes and amen. But if we want to have that life that is fully pleasing to the Lord, we need to be in the Word of God. If they wanted to enter in and, and do the service after walking around and, you know, ministry is messy. <laughs> life is messy. Whether your ministry is wherever it is, and sometimes we need, before we continue on or we go into the next place, we need to take a minute, look in the mirror, and freshen up. We need to see where we need to grow, where we need to forgive. So, and we do that in the Word of God. So the bronze labor. Verse 22. Moreover, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also take for yourselves quality spices, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, half as much, Sweet-smelling cinnamon, 250 shekels. 250 shekels of sweet-smelling cane. 500 shekels of cassia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hen of olive oil. You shall make from these a holy anointing oil, an ointment compounded according to the art of the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. With it you shall anoint the tabernacle of meeting and the ark of the testimony. The table and all its utensils, the lampstand and its utensils, the altar and its altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering with its utensils, and the laver and its base, you shall consecrate them that they may be most holy. Whatever touches them must be holy. And you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may, be, may minister to me as priests." And you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, This 
shall be a holy anointing oil to me throughout your generations. It shall not be poured on man's flesh, nor shall you make any other like it. According to its composition, it is holy, and it shall be holy to you. Whoever compounds any like it, or whoever puts any of it on an outsider, shall be cut off from his people. So the Lord, again, serious about these things. It is not to be this anointing oil that he would make, which um, reminds us or speaks of the Holy Spirit, was not to be put on man's flesh. It's not for the flesh. It's not to draw attention to ourselves as God empowers us or puts his Holy Spirit on us. It's not for those fleshly tendencies. It's not for our own selfish gain. The work of the Holy Spirit as it will consecrate, as it seals, as He, I guess I should say, is not to be imitated either. It's not for our own glory or our own gratification. It is to glorify Jesus Christ. As Jesus gave some of the great teachings on on the ministry of God the Holy Spirit, one thing that He pointed out is that he would not glorify himself, but he was there to glorify Jesus. And as we receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, as he would come upon you, or to empower your life, or to give you the work of the ministry, that is just just not for you. And so easy, and so often have men and women taken the gift and the empowering, the, the sealing of the Holy Spirit, and used it for their own gain. It's not for man's flesh. So often have people tried to imitate it or bring in this fake whatever. I don't want to create a laundry list, but it wouldn't take long. <laughs> it was so interesting to me, because you know I, I absolutely believe that God is still working and pouring out His gifts upon His church. But I remember one time very early in my walk when when someone had asked me if I would ever spoken tongues, I was like, and I told them no. And, and so they, in the best of intentions, they had shared with me this little phrase that I could repeat or, or whatever. And so that after a period of time or whatever in the right circumstance, I would find myself speaking in tongues. I believe that the God of the universe who created every language, who didn't need to give Adam instruction on language or the people dispersed at the Tower of Babel didn't have to stop and instruct each one how to speak a different language that he is more than capable of doing it in a moment whenever he so chooses. And we have to be careful of that. We want to make sure that he receives the glory that it is his work and we are simply the one who is being empowered or consecrated. It's not to be imitated. It's not to be put on man's flesh nor is there to be anything like it? I mean, look at the time when the guy, was it Simon the Sorcerer in Acts, tried to buy it and it didn't work out so good for him. God is very serious about this. Not only because, as Ananias and Sapphira found out in Acts chapter 5, that they, you know, they lied to the Holy Spirit, that was lying to God, and that was, you know, you just don't, you just don't mess with him. But he's not also not to be imitated or reproduced or faked or for your own vain glory. So this was a special compound, again, very similar to the the incense. It was only specifically for this one holy task. So be anointed, but make sure you follow the word. Verse 34, And the Lord said to Moses, Take sweet spices, a couple of those. <laughs> With pure frankincense and these sweet spices, there shall be equal amounts of each. You shall make of these an incense, a compound according to the art of the perfumer, salted, pure, and holy. And you shall beat some of it very fine and put some of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting where I will meet with you. It shall be most holy to you, but as for the incense which you shall make, you shall not make any for yourselves according to its composition. It shall be to you holy for the Lord. Whoever makes any 
like it. To smell it, he shall be cut off from his people. Again, a similar warning of things that were for the Lord, to speak of the Lord, that were solely for him and his will. Be a good warning, a good reminder, and maybe why it's so unpopular to to read through the Old Testament as we are becoming more of a selfish and narcissistic society, that we might find out that this wasn't supposed to be for us and we're not supposed to do all these things just to make ourselves happy or to smell it or to make ourselves look cool. It's for the Lord. (laughs) So, not to use for personal use or for attraction. Salt, interesting enough, as you throw it in there, it would help it to burn and bring that nice white color visible. Salt also has that preserving aspect about it. It's valuable. It brings healing and flavor. And if nothing else, you put it in there because God said so. <laughs> the things pertaining to the, the tabernacle are unique. And they are to stay that way because they speak of heavenly, holy things and they speak of Jesus Christ. And the incense, both the intercessory prayer that the Lord does for us, but also our prayers up before the Father. Chapter 31. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name a couple other gentlemen, the son, the son of Hur, the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God and wisdom and understanding and knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze and cutting jewels, for setting and carving wood, and to work in all manner of workmanship. And I indeed, I have appointed with him, the other guy of the tribe of Dan, and I will put wisdom in the hearts of all the gifted artisans, that they may make all that I have commanded you. The tabernacle of meeting, the ark of the testimony, and the mercy seat that is on it, and all its furniture, all of the furniture of the tabernacle, the table and its utensils, the pure gold lampstand with all its utensils, the altar of incense, the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the laver and its base, the garments of the ministry, the holy garments of Aaron, for Aaron the priest, and the garments of his sons to minister as priests, and the anointing oil and the sweet incense for the holy place, according to all that I have commanded you they shall do. <laughs> God equips us for the job. He certainly does. So these gentlemen were not only equipped for the job, called for the job, but they were also led, instructed, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and it was to all be done according to the Word of God. All essential parts for the ministry. Being equipped and called led and empowered by the Spirit, and all done according to God's holy word. There are many lists of gifts in, in the Scripture that the Holy Spirit gives. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4, Romans chapter 12. This one could, you know, maybe even be thrown in there too. That, that there is this work of the tabernacle that was to happen. And God called, gifted, empowered, and sent people to work on it. As he does with us. Spiritually chosen craftsmen. And each one are called to this. Some will work in different aspects of it. Some will work on different aspect of what is now the temple of God. It's just, it's just as important here, brings out, reminds us of as uh, spiritual things and the physical things that would be done. And each one had to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit, whether you were Aaron or you're the guy chiseling away on a precious stone. Both were important and both needed to be led and empowered by the Spirit of God. Each one blessed. Colossians 3.23, And whatever you do, do it heartily unto the Lord and not unto men. Not Moses, not Aaron, 
not her, not any of They were to do all of this to the Lord according to his word. Moses was just the mailman, brought the letter or whatever, FedEx guy. It was to be under the Lord, not Moses. It was God's work and God's word. And I think that's interesting that God would call all this massive group of people to do all of this work as he has called us, as he says we are being built up into a holy temple of God now. But we're not working on gold or silver or curtains. We're working with people that are much the same to the Lord. This tabernacle has turned to dust or been remelted down and made into something else. It doesn't exist anymore. But what we work on in our children, whether it's children's ministry or at our homes, what we work on downstairs before we meet up here, what we work on out in our community, as we invest in the body of Christ and build it up or are gifted in our various areas, we are laboring on something that is being built in eternity. Forever. Not a copy, but something that God is assembling and building here tonight. We get to partake in that. We may not be chiseling away at a a sapphire, but the person next to you may be just as important that he's given you to minister to. So let's remember that as they were gifted and called and building this beautiful tabernacle, which was just a shadow, was just a copy, and it's supposed to teach us about the ministry that we have before us, that we minister things into e- that are eternal. I'm thankful for that. Verse 12, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who, who sanctifies you. A covenant, a sign, not just religion and works, but this was to bring them back to make sure that you were grounded in relationship. This was a part of when he called them out. You're going to keep this so that you'll remember, the people around you will know that you are my covenant chosen people, that I am God with you. Verse 14, you shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death, for whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, Holy to the Lord, whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony of stone written with the finger of God. So we know in the New Testament for Romans 14 and Colossians chapter 2 that we are no longer bound to that day, to that rule, to that regulation. If you don't take Saturday night off, we're not going to drag you out and stone you. But the Lord still speaks through this principle, still speaks through this law. And in this, he reminds his people and he reminds us, as he goes through all this work of of prayer and ransom and being washed in the Word and the empowering and equipping of the Holy Spirit and working on his holy tabernacle, he says, hey, don't forget the Sabbath. We never want to let the finished work of Jesus Christ be overshadowed by our work for God. Oftentimes, joy is a good measurement or how refreshed we are of whether or not we've been taking time to spend time in His presence with Him. And we get dry. Sometimes we've been so busy with good things. I mean, they had to stop from building the tabernacle, this God-instructed thing that He's been spending a year getting them ready to do. And he says, hey, don't, nope, stop. You're going to spend some time with me. 
We want to remember that Jesus Christ is our rest, and we want to stop. We want to enjoy that sometimes. What we do for Him, it's kind of like, now for me, maybe it's simple, maybe it won't make sense to you. It's kind of like you got the sun, you know, you got the sun, the Lord, you got the moon, us. Let's just say the earth is works or things we're supposed to do or whatever. When we're in the right position, doing things well, we reflect His light and we bring it to where there is none or we enhance whatever it is, not of our own, but of His. But if we're in the wrong place, if we're laboring in the wrong spot, or we're walking beyond where we should, we may find out a place where we're on the wrong side of it, and we're experiencing an eclipse. We're not receiving that light anymore. We're just kind of feeling a little dark and shady. But other times when we're out here, and when maybe we thought that oil was supposed to get poured on our flesh and we were great, Sometimes we also become between the Lord and His work. and We block His light out completely rather than reflecting it. It's, time, it's important to stop and take that time to spend with Him, to put Him back on the throne of our hearts, to get in His Word and see where we've maybe wandered off or got a little, little mud on our hands or our feet or splattered on us as we go about our various ministries, whether they be physical or of a different work. Spend time with the Lord. Finally, he ends up with the completion of the Ten Commandments as he received all this other instruction. We say oftentimes when something's solid or not solid, whether or not it's been written in stone. But what made the Ten Commandments solid was because it was written by the finger of God, regardless of what it was written on. So take some... As the Lord calls you and gifts you, as your prayers go up before Him, and we're reminded of all these things that are built into the ministry and the work of life, that we're not our own, to be washed up, to be anointed and following the Word, to be working and building up His edifying, His people, His temple. As important as all of that is, It cannot be substituted for the time with dad. That personal time. A pump works way better if it stays primed rather than running dry. So I pray that you do that. So, as usual, the communion table is open if you so desire during the time of worship. There's no pressure. It's not something that that you have to do, but if it just blesses you and helps you draw near tonight, um, that's available as you seek Him. But may God bless you guys as He walked us through some, some more principles of His as He speaks through His Word and may keep you this week. So Father, we thank You for Your living Word. Lord, that 1,500 years after this was written, it absolutely applied in Jesus' day, and to Paul and the apostles and to the early church. And here we are, Lord, over 3,000 years later. We find that your word still speaks into our life. Lord, we're so thankful for that, Lord, that your word is alive. You are alive, Lord. Bless these guys, Lord. Empower them and equip them, Lord, by your spirit. And may we live a life that glorifies you, lived unto you and not unto men. In Jesus' name.